Perfect. Well, welcome everybody to today, today's, today's seminar. Um, I'm really excited. We have uh, three early career talks as we had a couple of um, last year as well, but we do have four speakers this time. Um, as always, I suggest we first hear the three talks and then uh, we have a round of questions afterwards. So if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your um, hand after the um, after the talks. Um, so, like I said, we have um, in total four speakers and we will start with the first talk, which is given by Laura Halvar and um, Lou Cherolier. Um, and they're both PhD students at Aros University. Um, Laura's background is in mar marine biology and she's um, studying the pigmentation and nutrient uptake of microalgae living on the Greenland ice sheet. And Lou um, is a trained engineer and she's focusing on incorporating the different mechanisms that darken the Greenland surface in numerical modelings, including the role of micro microalgae. So I think we'll hear a lot about algae today. And with that, over to you, Lou and Laura. Okay. Let's go. How do I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. Um, today, Laura and I will present our work as part of the project Deep Purple to understand more about who are these microalgae darkening the ice, uh, why they darken the ice, how much, and a little bit about what we can expect for the future. Um, so, as you heard in the introduction, introduction, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Laura and I have quite different backgrounds and approaches on the subject. Um, and yet these approaches are really complementary and we hope that you enjoyed this multidisciplinary talk. Um, if you want more details or background information, the PIs of Deep Ripple gave a talk uh, last year that is available on the IGS YouTube channel. Okay, so we've known for a long time that snow and ice surfaces can uh, darken from the presence of light absorbing particulates that can be deposited, that can upcrop or grow at the surface. Um, on snow, the focus has been put on black carbon and dust, uh, whilst on bare ice, uh, black cryoconite holes have received particular attention. Um, and we've heard, um, we learned uh, of them in a talk three weeks ago by Professor Takuchi. Um, but recent, recent research also highlighted the role of uh, microalgae blooming at the surface in um, lowering the surface albedo. Um, and uh, indeed, this is cited in the, last, um, in the last IPCC report where biologically active impurities, oops, sorry, biologically active impurities are cited as a control on um, bare ice albedo. Um, so in fact, microalgae uh, living on the bare ice are coloring the surface in a uh, dark gray, or sometimes other people see deep purple. Um, and these algae are found around the world and they're particularly abundant in the uh, dark zone of Greenland where they're thought to be an important control on the darkening. Um, and in fact, in a, at a site in this region, it's been estimated that they contributed 10 to 13% um, of the surface runoff. But darkening doesn't need to be uh, red, uh, doesn't need to be dark or gray. Um, it can also be uh, red or pinkish uh, from um, microalgae blooming on the snow. Uh, and these also have uh, an important impact as they've been estimated to drop the, the albedo of uh, Arctic glaciers for about 13% across the melting season and contribute to about 17% of the snow melt in an Alaskan uh, snowfield. Okay, yeah, so you just heard that these algae play a really important role for lowering the albedo and hence accelerating the ice melt. So let's look into who they actually are and why they darken the ice surface or the snow surface. And there are mainly two other groups which should be considered here. One of them are glacier algae and they produce these um, yeah, distinct brown purple colored uh, pigment called in short purpurgalin. And then the other group are snow algae and they accumulate red pigments, which are different versions of asaxanthine. And yeah, the primary reason why they, these algae produce these dark pigments is to protect themselves from too much sunlight and to avoid any damaging effects by that. 
And yeah, the different types of the pigments and uh, yeah, which they produce have really, yeah, their unique chemical structure. And this has also implications for the absorption capacities of the pigments, but also eventually for the algal cells. And they're really the reason why the pigments are the reason why they have this albedo lowering effect. So we were interested in studying the pigmentation and the absorption in more detail. And therefore we sampled an algal community on a glacier from Southeast Greenland. And we collect samples on a snowpack and also on the bare ice areas. And there we characterized the community composition, which we split here into glacier algae and snow algae. And yeah, that's shown here as percentage biomass. And then we also analyzed and characterized the pigment composition. And the glacier algae pigments are yeah, mainly purpurogaline, so the brown pigment. And the snow algae pigment is shown here in yellow. Uh, these are the astaxanthines. And what we found is that on the snow, where there were mainly snow algae, also their pigments were most abundant, um, as we also expected. But then surprisingly, on the bare ice area, um, despite the low biomass of snow algae there, still their pigments were really dominating the extracted pigment pool. And the glacier algae pigment, yeah, was not so dominant, even though the glacier algae biomass was much more, um, well, much higher. So we wanted to understand what implications this has also for the absorption. So that's why we looked into the absorption coefficients of the different pigments over yeah, the visible wavelength range. And as you can see, these asaxanti, so the snow algae pigments, absorb much more effectively in the mid-visible wavelength range. And in this, that range, the incoming solar irradiance is also much higher. And in the UV range where pupogaline absorbs, the incoming irradiance is actually much lower. So yeah, we were wondering what implications this has for the relative role of the darkening of these two algal groups. And if these results could mean that snow algae actually absorb more than glacier algae. So in order to answer these questions on the following fieldwork campaign, uh, we sampled for uh, glacier and snow algae. Uh, and this time we measured the absorption coefficient of the whole cells rather than uh, the extracted pigments from the cells. And uh, what, we what we obtained with this absorption coefficient were, were results that were quite uh, contrasting from the pigment analysis. Because as you can see on the graph, on the per cell basis, glacier algae actually absorb more than snow algae. And this is due to a packaging effect that has been um, documented a lot in the marine literature. And that seems to apply to our freshwater algae as well. Um, this has implications for uh, remote sensing uh, detection of algae and modeling of their impact, because it seems that we cannot um, base a remote sensing algorithm and um, modeling parameterization on the pigment signatures because the signature of the, the whole cells that um, seems to be actually quite different. Uh, so then we use this coefficient to put them in a radiative transfer model to answer original question, which was um, what is the relative role in the darkening of these two algae? And um, we ran the model for different ice and surface types ice and snow uh, surfaces. And we found that glacier algae were three to four times more impactful on the surface albedo than snow algae. So once we got these results, we um, wondered, okay, they impact three to four times more than snow algae, but what about the absolute, absolute numbers? Uh, how much do they actually um, impact on the albedo? So during the same uh, fieldwork campaign, we collected um, albedo uh, measurements using a um, spectral radiometer. Uh, and at this site, we observed mainly uh, glacier algae and we obtained these spectra that you uh, see in the middle of the slide with um, a typical biological uh, signature with this 675 um, chlorophyll absorption peak that is just right here. Um, so we can see that there is a clear role in biology here in lowering the albedo, but we don't know how much because we don't know what was the albedo of the ice without the algal bloom. So what we did is that we reconstructed um, 
the, the field spectra with the radiated transfer model that we mentioned just before um, to get the clean ice background. And so what you see now is the, um, what the uh, albedo would look like if there was no algal bloom on the surface. Um, so you can see the impact mainly on the visible spectrum where we're going to zoom in now. Um, and so from this clean ice background, we added uh, uh, algal concentration in the in the model and we obtain these curves so we had uh, quite a good match between our field spectra and uh, and our model output and from this we use 20 different uh, field spectra to estimate the um, impact on albedo of only the algae by uh, subtracting the clean ice to the algal ice and we obtained that um, glacier algae dropped the albedo from four to forty percent with an equivalent of one to nine liters uh, generated per square meter per day. Um, so these results were uh, obtained from quite a wide uh, range of concentration, but other um, higher concentrations have been measured uh, in other places, such as in the dark zone of Greenland, which is our focus area for um, next uh, field work. Um, and then we would also like to try to uh, upscale these estimations because for now this is only looking at a 30 uh, centimeter diameter uh, footprint. And um, so we would like, for example, to apply this reconstruction technique to uh, hyperspectral imagery. Um, and then um, in the future, it would also be uh, really interesting to look at the temporal variability of uh, this, uh, of the impact of the um, algal blooms. Uh, which would require coupling or a model to uh, a growth model. Yeah, and so to, to build such a growth model, we need to understand, of course, which factors control the growth generally of the algal blooms. And yeah, and they will, of course, also ultimately um, control the distribution and the magnitude of the blooms. And one potentially important one is nutrient availability because the bare ice habitat is a very oligotrophic um, environment. So that means that inorganic nutrients are very, very low concentrated. So that's why we were wondering if one of the macronutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus could potentially limit the productivity of glacier algae. And therefore, um, yeah, as a first step, we collected samples and um, analyzed the elemental composition of single glacier algae cells by using scanning electron microscopy coupled to energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. And yeah, we then obtained a carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, which is elevated compared to yeah, this ratio from algae from other habitats. And that um, shows that under in situ conditions, the algae are already adapted to a low nutrient availability, likely by producing, for example, metabolites, so any compounds, also pigments, for example, that don't contain nitrogen or phosphorus. But to yeah, find out if one of the nutrients is limiting the growth, we also incubated um, the glacier algae with different nutrients, and we used 13C labeled bicarbonate to trace the primary production. Because the 13C isotope of carbon is very low concentrated naturally, so when we use 13C to 12C isotopic ratio, um, we can then trace the primary production. Um, yeah, And we would in expect an elevated ratio if the activity was high. So then we analyzed um, this isotopic ratio using secondary ion mass spectrometry um, yeah, again, of single glacier algal cells. And yeah, as you can see here, in when we added ammonium or phosphorus or both nutrients together, their 13C to 12C ratio did not increase compared to the control. So that means that overall, we didn't find any indications for nutrient limitation. So it seems that overall, the, yeah, the algae are very well adapted to um, yeah, they're nutrient poor conditions, uh, which is reflected in the high CMP ratios and potentially or generally they also seem to be very quick in taking up the inorganic nutrients, which they may encounter. Um, it could also be that they're able actually to take up organic nutrients, which are much higher concentrate, concentrated on the ice. Um, so that's still an open question. 
Um, yeah, so overall, that means if the bare ice areas extend, which is actually happening on Greenland because of climate change, so the snow line is retreating yeah, much more earlier in the year, it could mean that glacier algae could colonize new areas. However, other factors um, yeah, will also be important to consider. To name one of them is, for example, rainfall, which is increasing on Greenland, and that could act potentially as a limiting distribution factor for the algae by washing cells down yeah, the slope. So yeah, there's still some open questions, but we hope that we could give you at least some insights into yeah, some aspect of the pigmentation, the albedo and the nutrient uptake of these tiny organisms. And yeah, thank you for listening and please let us know at the end of all the talks if there are any questions. Perfect. Thanks you too. That was really um, interesting. And with that, I would say we go to the next um, talk, which is by Catherine. Um, you want to share your screen? Yep. Mm -mm. So Catherine is a PhD student as well, um, using numerical geodynamic models of the ice shell of one of the moons of Jupiter. And she's also doing a spectral and hyperspectral analysis of, of the contaminants of its surface that could be related to the tectonic activity. And with that, over to you, Catherine. Um. Hello, good night everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Tonight I'm going to present you a research that I did on Enceladus. Uh, it's a theoretical result. Um, so um, let me know if you have some question by the end of the presentation. Uh, the title is Comparative Geochemistry Analysis Between the Ocean of Enceladus and the Ocean of Earth During the Snowball Event. First of all, let me introduce a big of me. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in planetary science and International Research School of Planetary Science in Pescara, Italy. Uh, my research is focused in the numerical geodynamic model within the icy shell of Ganymede. Also, currently I am doing an international exchange at the Laboratory of Geology in the University Claude, Claude Bernard Lyon in France, where I am working in the hyperspectral analysis of the contaminant on the surface of Ganymede. Also, I had a master in astronomy and astrophysics in Valencia, Spain. Uh, and also, I am a geology engineer from Guayaquil, Ecuador. Here, you can see some picture of me working as a geophysicist on field. Also, I am a traveler lover. As you see here behind me is the Vinicuca Mountain, the Rainbow Mountain in Peru. And my current activities are to be as a PhD student in planetary science and also assistant to conference. So what are you going to see tonight? Uh, I'm going to tell you the motivation about this research. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the ancient atmosphere of air, uh, also the atmosphere of Enceladus, the methodology that apply in this research, the primitive terrestrial oceans, the ocean of Enceladus, the results, a big discussion and this fun conclusion about this research. So first of all, let's start for the motivation. The Cassini mission launching in October 1997 and Saturn was for analyze the chemical composition of the Saturn and the moon, including Titan and Enceladus. And some of the instruments on board of the Cassini mission, like the ion and neutral mass spectrometer ENMS and the cosmic dust analyzer detected water vapor, trace of organic molecules, some silicon, sodium, ammonia, and hydrate salt that could be related with a possible liquid water within the global ocean that is, has been located in the south pole of Enceladus. But the liquid water is not clear till now, so I was focused on this part. So for knowing that, my <coughs> interest was to compare <coughs> the current conditions that has Enceladus and compare it with the ancient condition of air during the snow water period. So for knowing that, Enceladus is ice covered like the air during the snow even that could be generated in a, well, is in fact a glaciation, but could generate life in the future. That is the one question that I would like to solve. Uh, for do that, uh, I do an analysis of the chemical composition of the ocean beneath the icy shell. 
and also compared with the aqueous geochemistry of the primitive ocean of air during the snowball event, uh, with the possibility to infer if this component could involve to harbor life. First of all, um, let me introduce about how was the evolution of the oxygen in the glaciation air that in fact has been has been five during the period of air. And starting for the uranium in the paleoproterozoic area, there was a slightly increment of oxygen in the atmosphere and in the shallow ocean. After in the cryogen in the neoproterozoic area, this one and the snowball even, well, in fact, in this area and start the snowball period, the carbon dioxide was the most important gas and the most abundant in the atmosphere. The next era is the Andesarian in the Ordovician and Permian during the Paleozoic era. There was a global column that provoked an increase in oxygen in the atmosphere and started the diversity of particles of the brachiopods. After the Carboniferous and Permian Paleozoic era, it started the oxygenation of the atmosphere and there were a development of big species. And the last one, the quaternary Holocene Earth, there were big quantities of carbon dioxide that were liberated to the atmosphere from the deep ocean. The global greenhouse began provoking a melting of the icy crust and the distribution of the ocean, of the ocean gas impact, and as we know nowadays. So according to Holland et al, um, the most oxygenation on the atmosphere in the shallow ocean and in the east and in the deep ocean are present in the in the current days. Uh, we can see here in this graphic that in the quaternary the conditions on air change. And during the two second glaciation, uh, what was small, I am focusing this part because it seems to be similar to the condition of Enceladus. What happened in the atmosphere of Enceladus? The instrument on board of the casting emission provides evidence about the composition of the atmosphere of Enceladus. There was detected species like water ice with concentrations, uh, not so high, but uh, are considerable. Also carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and methane. This methane could be related with certain kind of organic activity that in fact has, has been detected organic molecules on Enceladus, but uh, we cannot say that uh, it's related with life or not. <clears throat> also, the other instrument detected a residual mass peak point toward trace quantity or other as gases as ammonia, acetylene, hydrogen, cyanine, and propano. All of them related with the carbon chains. So the atmosphere, as you see in this picture, uh, is thought to be a remnant of the material expelled from the plumes. This is the cross of Enceladus, and this is the fractures and plumes that are present there. All this material, um, well, the material that is ejected from this plume, uh, constitutes the atmosphere that has been detected there. The most, element, the most relevant element present there is the carbon dioxide and the molecular hydrogen, and the combination of them create a certain kind of methane that we don't know if this methane could be present in the ocean in few quantities, could be related with life activity. We don't know, but we are going to see. What is the methodology that I apply here? <clears throat> I try to compare which is the composition, well, which were the composition of air, and uh, with the composition of the current ocean of Enceladus. So for do that, I did a review of the aqueous chemical composition of the ocean during the Nova event using this bibliography, that is of geochemistry by Holland and Turkey in 2004, and the seawater is composition cooperating a behavior uh, for Brown in 2004. And Enceladus, I did a calculation of the concentration of the species through the method applied by Gian and Al 2014. Uh, for doing this calculation, I took the data, the spectral data from the PDS, the planetary atmosphere node that is available uh, from the database from the Cassini mission. Uh, the thing that I found on air is that the primitive ocean was composed for this species. The oceans in, in that period showed a reduced state due to the presence of sodium, that is one of the most abundant, and the chlorine, and they were present till the end of the Paleoproterozoic. Also, the concentration of sulfate acid, this one, is a big high. 
and raised during the Neoguterozoico Cryogenia era. That is when we start the Snow Wall event. And the lower presence of oxygen is probably the most relevant shape beside the higher acidity of water due to the higher carbon dioxide atmosphere composition uh, during that period. On Enceladus, uh, I found this concentration uh, is similar uh, to the one that there were found on, on air during the Snow White period, but with a low concentration. The sodium and chloro are the most relevant species, and this ocean with the most relevant concentration can be classified as a sodium chloro and trioxidone type water. The amount of carbonate as big carbonate so ions here, these two ones, could come from the soluble carbonate minerals associated to hydrothermal activity on Enceladus. And due to the depletion of protons and interaction with free hydroxyl growth, the pH of the system is more basic than the one present on Earth. So the result between both comparison, because I took the species that were present in both oceans, is that, uh, as I said before, the sodium and the chlorine were present in both oceans, were, were present in the ocean of air and are present in the ocean of Enceladus. Uh, not with the same quantity, but are the most uh, relevant species. In Enceladus, uh, it was found that it uh, has more dissolving organic carbon material than air. There are these ion carbonates and the bicarbonate ions. Um, well, uh, on air, in fact, there were more concentration of organic material because it start the interaction and the first cyanobacteria start appearing in this period. Um, this, uh, this inorganic presence of Enceladus concentration could be due to the serpentinization and production of molecular hydrogen that has been detected on Enceladus. And the lower concentration of sulfuric acid on Enceladus is a consequence that the only aqueous redundant sulfur ions react with oxidants. You see here uh, the, the concentration of sulfur uh, is present in two kinds of lower and larger concentration. So this is due to the aqueous redundant that are present on Enceladus, um, as I showed before. This one this redundance, and the larger concentration uh, is due to minerals like sodium that are considered as a source of reductants. So the discussion here is that the most abundant ion species are sodium and chlorine in both oceans. It is possible the serpentinization of seafloor because of the presence of molecular hydrogen on Enceladus. The pH is more basic on Enceladus, 12.2, than on air, that is 8.1. The silica, water vapor, and ammonia give close of a possibility of a possible hydrothermal activity on Enceladus. And it is good to remember that the origin of light on air become in the deep ocean, where the component of light emerges to the hot spot. So what is the closest environment that we can find on air and that is present on Enceladus? It's the low city hydrothermal vents. There is a system that is thought to have the most similar condition in the ocean of Enceladus. On air, the abiotic formation of amino acids was true to the hydrothermal reactions <coughs> inside of these, um, these vent systems that can be present also on Enceladus. And the biotic source comes from a hypothetical methanogenesis consuming the hydrogen produced by serpentinization. The methanogenesis is present on Enceladus because it has been detected methane. And the hydrogen is a result of the serpentinization in the seafloor. But, uh, and also, the environmental conditions inside the ocean on Enceladus are thought to be in accord with life because the temperature are are low but uh, are close on the on the shallow ocean on the liquid water that can be present in the ocean beneath the icy cloud between zero to 90, 90 degrees celsius the salinity from the plume between 0 0.5 and 2 degrees is lower than air that is 3.5 the pressure between 0 0.5 bar to 600 bar and all this value could be found within the liable environmental air that are called the string environment so, but could it be possible for those molecules detected on Enceladus to emerge on the surface? 
To try to solve this, uh, it was done a simulation of the evolution of the atmosphere on Enceladus if it will have clouds. They were using the never stored equation with a greenhouse effect uh, to simulate with all the components that are present on, on the atmosphere of Enceladus. And the simulation said that the, between the, the first 10,000 taking as a common study stage, uh, the resin, uh, the, the time present, till 10,000 years, the temperature start increasing and is stable to zero degrees. Um, after the 10,000 years to 20,000 years, there is a decrease of the temperature, minus 4.5. And after 20,000 years to the first 1 million years, the temperature start increasing and being constant to zero degrees. And after the 1 million years, in advance, uh, the simulation was till 25,000, 25 million of years. The temperature on Enceladus start to be decreased, start to increase to zero degrees. So the simulation shows that if, in fact, these gases are liberated to the plume on Enceladus, they could create a greenhouse effect in the atmosphere that produces a destabilization of the icy crust, um, allowing that these molecules come to the surface and interact with the atmosphere and creating the component of life. So the conclusion is that there were periods where the air looked like the current icy cover and condition of Enceladus. During those periods, the air had a liquid ocean beneath the crust as is present on Enceladus. And the first snowball event was after the Archeum, and it was related to the Greek oxidation event. And the concentration of sulfur were like the ones that were present on Enceladus. The hydrothermal activity on Enceladus is like the hot spot in the deep ocean of air. There are terrestrial organisms living in a skin environment like the chemical condition of the ocean of Enceladus. And there is a slight possibility that the component building of light emerged to the surface in a million of years if it will occur a destabilization of the icy crust and the icy crust, and if these gases can interact with the atmosphere. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for taking us to Enceladus. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, if you unshare the screen, perfect, then uh, Ugo could share the screen, who is the next okay. speaker. Perfect, that looks good. Um, so next speaker is Ugo Nani, um, who has just finished his PhD last year from University of Grenoble in uh, the Alps. And he has now started a postdoc at the University of Oslo, where he investigates the basal conditions of soft bed surging glaciers in Svalbard using seismology and complementary geophysical observations. And with that, over to you, Hugo. Great. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm very pleased to uh, meet you tonight. Uh, and I thank, of course, uh, the IGS committee for. Uh, giving me the, the opportunity to present my work. Um, so today I will present you work I've been conducting on uh, investigating the subglacial hydrology dynamics uh, using a dense seismic array. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Um, so so uh, how I was saying, the aim of uh, the talk is to investigate subglacial hydrologic condition. So when we have uh, meltwater supply, so meltwater production, because of surface melt or precipitation, uh, such water can penetrate at the base of the glacier when it reaches the subglacial environment. And there, subglacial water condition can control the sliding by lubrication. And sliding is, of course, a very important component of the glacial dynamics. And therefore, studying glacial uh, hydrology can help to better understand glacial dynamics. However, the response of glacier to water supply is not unique and is not that easy to understand. Here I will present uh, the velocity in black and the water supply in blue as averaged over Greenland Glacier uh, for uh, a melt season. What we can see is at the beginning of the melt season, when we have an increase in water supply in blue, we have a strong response of the glacier dynamics because the glaciers accelerate. But as the melt water supply is continue to increase, 
we can see that the velocity does not increase anymore and uh, indeed slightly decrease. So we have a complex response, a dual response of the glacial dynamics to the hydrology. And such response is due to the way that the drainage system is quite complex. So if the neck water supply is routed through the inefficient and distributed drainage system, uh, which is often thought to be composed of small cavities, at least for our bed glacier, or for porous media for the soft bed glacier, then when we have the water that inundate the system, it will tend to produce high basal water pressure and therefore favor the glacial flow. On the other hand, if the water is routed through an efficient and localized drainage system, which is often represented as channels that can be melted into the ice or dug into the sediment, then the water will be efficiently drained at the base of the glacier, which will tend to lower the basal water pressure and therefore to promote less glacial flow. So we have these two very nice uh, pictures and, and here on this graph, but the reality is a bit more complex and especially it's quite difficult to understand what's happened at the base of the glacier because uh, we have very limited observation. Of course, it's under uh, 100 of meter of ice. The key observation that we have now, it's uh, obtained with ground penetrating radars that allows to derive the geometry of N glacial or subglacial channels but still, we don't really uh, access the physical properties with such method. On the other end, uh, basal water pressure measurements give direct access to the basal properties, but uh, yet very heterogeneous and punctual measurements because the glacier bed is really heterogeneous. So we have a complex system with limited observation, and therefore, we have a remaining question that, yeah, it's quite long, which is when where and under which condition subglacial water flow favors or impedes glacial flow. So I'm not going to answer this question tonight, but I will address it and try to answer it uh, by asking another question, which is, can we observe this? Can we observe uh, subglacial water flow that directly favor or impedes glacial flow? And can we observe in which context, in which geometry, we have such uh, system that favor or impedes glacial flow? And at the beginning of my talk, I was talking about seismology, and it's because I think uh, that we can observe this using seismology, and this is what I am going to show you uh, today or tonight. So how can seismology help? So the base of the glacier, when we have a subglacial water flow, it's often turbulence, and therefore it tends to generate frictional forces that then will generate uh, ice shaking or ground shaking that can propagate within the glacier and be recorded at the seismic station at or near the glacier. Uh, so the investigation of subglacial hydrology with seismology is quite recent, actually. And uh, it has been uh, shown uh, recently, so one of the study I did during my PhD, that the seismic power uh, measured at the given frequency range, the one that is sensitive to subglacial water flow, uh, is well correlated with water discharge, and this uh, over complete melt season, so I'll show you over two years. But so far, there have, on, there have only been a study about the temporal evolution of the seismic power related to uh, glacial flow. What I would like to ask uh, here is can we map the subglacial water dynamics and can we observe the transition between an inefficient drainage system and an efficient drainage system? So to answer this question, I focus on the transition from the winter period to the melt season. And uh, I have installed, together with a lot of colleagues, a dense seismic array on the surface of an alpine glacier, which is the Argentia glacier, which is a very interesting glacier because we have concomitant water discharge measurement uh, that show during the or survey period that we have an increase in water supply. And at the same time, we observe a uh, very pronounced change in glacial velocity which shows that we have a good coupling between the glacial hydrology and the glacial velocity. So now uh, we installed these 100 seismometers, and the aim was to uh, at least uh, map the subglacial hydrology. But here we run into a methodological problem. So we have this uh, thematical question about glaciology, but we also have a methodological problem about seismology, which is how can we locate uh, noise sources? So, uh, an impulsive signal uh, could be generated by an earthquake or a crevasse, 
but some natural overflow generate noise because it's really incoherent. I guess you have all been near a river and you can really have this feeling of what's the noise. And noise is quite a bit more complicated than impulsive signal. So today to investigate uh, the noise and the continuous noise source, I will focus on the phase component of the seismic signal, which bears the temporal information. And therefore, when we use a lot of seismometers, bears spatial information about the sources. So the method we used is to look at the wave field of uh, the seismic signal. Here I show you an example for an impulsive source, which was a crevasse uh, within the area. So we measured over one second, 100 of waveform, that's the 100 sensors, and you can see here in the figure that we have a very nice and a very clear impulsional events. When we look at the phase component over the seismic array, we can see that we have concentric circles all around uh, a given location that we can find if we match the observed phase component with a model phase component and then minimize the difference between the two. So locating an impulsive source is quite, it's relatively easy when we have a dense seismic array. It's a bit like trying to find where the, the stone was thrown into the lake by looking at the concentric waveform. But what uh, we want to do is to look at noise sources because uh, we look at sublation information. So noise sources are a bit more tricky. It's a bit more like multiple reference that collide and interact with each other because several sources are active simultaneously. Therefore, we do not observe a global phase current over the array, but rather a lot of very local phase currents. Here, I show you that when we have these very noisy signals, we can find some local phase currents uh, where we can individuate some signal, which means that a few sensors see the same events, but other sensors on another part of the array see different events. And uh, traditionally, people have been discarding uh, such uh, low phase currents because it was thought to be a very low accuracy and uh, not to be uh, used. What we, uh, what we did, and it was a big part of my PhD, it is really to, to keep this idea of looking at the phase currents, but focusing on the low phase currents. So we are looking, investigating one second signal, and every second we are locating sources based on their phase currents, even if it was a low. And we did so for uh, the 35 days of our period, which yields millions of sources uh, that we can then sort uh, to their different characteristics. So this is the methodological part. Uh, what do we observe now when we touch, apply such method on the Argentine measure with the 100 seismometer? Let me first show you what we observe when we look at the high phase currents. Uh, so again, I recall these very nice signals. What I show you here, it's a map. So you have the glacier, uh, the location of the different seismometers. And it's a map obtained when I only look at sources within a given frequency range and a given phase coherence, so between 50% and 100% of coherence over the area. So the color scale shows the number of events per square meter per day. And what we see, it is that most of the events located at high phase coherence and high frequency are on the side of the glacier where we observe crevasse. So you may say that we do not observe any events inside the, the array. It's because we installed the array where there was no crevasses just due to uh, logistical uh, issues uh, during field work. But what I want to highlight here, it is that high phase coherence events are related to crevasse and very nice impulsive events. What if we look now at the low phase coherence? So low phase coherence is very noisy signal. And uh, what we observe when we look at this map that was obtained also with a 30 day stack of all sources. Again, the color bar is the number of sources per square meter. And now I focus on the frequency band that is sensitive to sublation water flow. And I have uh, located more than 1 million events. We can see that all events align along the glacier flow. So the glacier is flowing from bottom to top uh, and uh, align the glacier flow where the prediction of, uh, based on algorithm prudential, predicts sublation water waves. So when we have the bed geometry, uh, we can predict the hydraulic potential and find where uh, the, the water would run. 
But for our glacier, it was a, a very simple fish-shaped glacier, a U-shaped glacier. So the water was extracted through the on the middle. And this is where we found that we have the highest source uh, density uh, with more than uh, 25 km per square meter. So this shows that using our plain seismic array and our method, we are capable of locating subglacial water flows. But it's nice, we have uh, a wet snapshot and we have uh, a rough picture of the subglacial water flow. But can we go one step further? What if we look now not only at the 30 day stack, but a seven day stack, and we look at the different time during the season? Again, uh, the maps uh, show the density of the events for a given period of time, and the corresponding water discharge is so just under this. And we can see that as the water discharge increases, we transition from a distributed system, so distributed sources, to a more localized system, where you can see that when water discharge is high, we have a very nice localization of the sources along the glacier flow line, where the bed is at its deepest. And such, uh, such dynamic shows that we are capable of capturing the dynamics of the hydrological system on a very short time scale, so a multi day time scale, and that such dynamics transition from a distributed to a localized system. And here I, I summarize this dynamic with this red curve, uh, which is a cross correlation of this pattern to all of the other pattern. And therefore, when this curve increases, it means that we transition from a distributed drainage system to a localized drainage system. And now I can use this curve uh, to compare it with the other properties we have on the glacier. So first, I recall here the groundwater discharge. So again, we have a transition from a distributed to a localized drainage system when the water discharge increases. But if we compare it to the glacial velocity, we can see that at the beginning of the period, the glacial velocity fluctuates quite high when we have a very low fluctuation of water discharge. And then the glacial velocity stays quite low as the water discharge continues to increase, which would tend to suggest that at the beginning of the period, the system, hydraulic system is quite inefficient. Uh, and therefore, a very small input can generate a change in glacial velocity. And then the system becomes more efficient and more localized when that is shown because we observe uh, less change in velocity. And now we can compare it with hydraulic parameters that were inverted with the seismic measurement, which shows that the hydraulic radius, so the capacity of the drainage system, increases as the system tends to localize, and the pressure condition of the drainage system decreases as the system localized. So this shows that we observe the transition from an inefficient drainage system to an efficient drainage system, and we can both quit and we can both evaluate the efficiency of the system but also geometry and also uh, area where the drainage system has a very low hydraulic conductivity, which are areas where we do not observe any uh, subglacial sources and any seismic events. And uh, to conclude, I would like just to highlight this part that when we observe an inefficient drainage system, this means that we have water flow because we need a generation of seismic signal. And what we suggest is that we have water flow uh, that's uh, in between the cavities that generate enough signal to be observed by the seismic uh, evaluation. And with this, I would like to thank you and just uh, uh, give you the announcement of the next talk of uh, this week. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Hugo. That was really great. Um, do we have questions? Please do put questions either in the or just indicate in the chat if you have a question uh, uh, or raise your hand with the um, Zoom button. Uh, while you're still on, Ugo, I have a question. How did you calculate the hydraulic radius? I don't know a lot about what that actually means, but how was that calculated? Yeah, um, so just share my screen here. So here I have the hydraulic radius. Uh, so the hydraulic radius is calculated based on the seismic measurement. Uh, uh, so when we use the seismic measurement, there is a relation between the seismic energy and the hydraulic properties, which are the quantity of water, but also uh, the, the weighted perimeter 
where we have the network. And, and we derive uh, equation, physical equation between the, the quantity of water and the hydraulic radius to the seismic volume. So, so the hydraulic radius gives a measure for basically how much water there is flowing. Uh, for, for the size, for the size of the conduits. Ah, okay. It's the weighted perimeters because this is what controls the size of the turbulences and, uh, and therefore the seismic power. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. And um, Paco also has a quick comment for Ugo. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, they were all really nice, but I, I was. I don't have particular questions. Just to make the comment that I was really impressed by Hugo presentation, just because of the, um, I never could expect that uh, this use of the seismic waves just to detect the, the water flow under glaciers and even the switch from uh, one regime to other regime is really nice. And I hope to see the paper published uh, really, really soon. So congratulations to all, but especially to you, just yes, because I got really impressed. Thank you. Could this method be applied on any glacier, Ugo? Uh, if you install a dense seismic array, yes. Um, okay. So limitation of the method and more the size of the seismic array you will, you will use. So for instance, on, for Greenland Glacier, where we have maybe 1,000 meters of ice thickness, you will need a larger array aperture because this is what's controlled at which depths you can locate uh, the sources. Of course, the resolution will be a bit smaller, but since a uh, subglacial system in Greenland is much bigger than the one in the Alps, where we only have a few cubic meters per second, then this would yield to a similar uh, relative resolution. Nice, okay. Really interesting. And Roger has another question for you. Go ahead, yeah. Roger. Thanks very much, Hugo. And, and I should start by apologizing to, to Laura and Lou and Catherine, because you've just reminded me how much chemistry I've forgotten. Um, but question for Ugo, what, what about um, anisotropy in the ice? Do, does that um, bias or shift any positioning that you're inferring for these events? Uh, what sort of mechanism are the events? If they're all sliding events, what, what kind of signal are you picking up and what kind of geophones? Are they, are they near vertical P signals or whatever? Yeah. Okay, so the first question about the anisotropy. Uh, we do observe ice anisotropy, actually, and we do quantify it. Uh, but it's quite uh, interesting. Let me just show you a picture of what we observe. It is when we look at different phase coherences, uh, we look at uh, seismic waves that can be deflected by uh, passive crevasses and debris within the crevasses. So we look at really different patterns which shows that when we choose different frequencies and different phase coherences, then we can look at different types of sources, uh, which means, therefore, that when we look at the subglacial agrology sources, we are much less influenced by the ice anisotropy uh, than when we look at higher frequencies, uh, where the, the, the typical scale uh, where the ice anisotropy is changing uh, is on the order of the seismic windows. So, so yes, we do have ice anisotropy, but given the wavelengths we investigate for subglacial hydrology, they have a very limited impact on what we observe. Um, does that answer your first question? Uh, it, it was just a thought about what the actual physical mechanisms were yeah. of, of the very many events that you, of the million events that you were you were finding, and how it relates to you know, signal types, geophone types, yeah. and so on. Yeah, so the geophone we use uh, uh, are three component geophones, but we do the location just with the vertical component uh, that we filter uh, using a very narrow uh, frequency band between three and seven hertz. And the typical waveform we observe are the one I show here. Uh, so it's very noisy. Uh, when we look at very low phase coherences, we do not have clear impulsion of events as when we look at high phase coherences. So, if you would look at all events located uh, with such low phase coherences, it will all be noise. That's why we need to locate uh, a huge amount of them to have a statistical way caused uh, problem. 
Mm. Thanks very much. That's great. Okay, we have a question from Colin. You just want to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah, great talk. Thanks very much. On that last question on anisotropy, with your array, I guess you should be able to pick up azimuthal anisotropy. Did you look for azimuthal anisotropy? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. So we looked for azimuthal uh, anisotropy. So the way we did it, it is that we located the very well uh, located impulsive events and look, then look at how the amplitude of the events was changing depending on how they were uh, sampling the glacier. So if we have events here, they will sample the glacier long flow. And if we have events here, they will sample the glacier cross flow when we measure them. And we observe a strong ice anisotropy. Uh, I do not have an image here, but this is what we are currently doing to quantify how the glacial structure changed yeah. the propagation. Yeah, so that, that's a comment on amplitudes, but uh, you should be able to see the, the phase varying with azimuth should be like an ellipse, right? So uh, with one of the axes aligned with the direction of flow. Did you see that? Uh, it's, it's very, I mean, it's, it's not pronounced very much. We, we can, we have seen it when we have very well located events, uh, but that's why we are looking at the amplitude because uh, it's much more pronounced as the amplitude. Okay, thank you. Nice. Okay. Um, I have a quick, sorry, did, uh, yeah, that, that did answer the question. I have a question for Lou and Laura. Um, if you could share your screen, you did show a slide where you said something like um, the amount of albedo change equals to one to nine liters per square meter per day. What is that? Is that belt? Um, sorry, it jumped. The Wi-Fi jumped. Can you just repeat the last words? Um, so uh, you said something like uh, you have an increase in albedo, uh, a lower, lowering in albedo, and um, you had something like that equals to one to nine liters per square meter per day. What is that? Melt or? Yeah, so it's calculated on uh, basically the drop in albedo is broadband albedo, and then multiplying this by the incoming irradiance, you get the amount of energy that's being absorbed. And then from this, you uh, we assume that all the energy is then used for melting ice, uh, and that's how we get the melt numbers. So you could probably, or maybe this is already done, calculate how much how much more Greenland is melting due to the increased albedo or do you, I guess you need more measurements for that? Yeah, it needs to be upscaled and there are already studies looking at the, um, the distribution of algal blooms on the whole uh, dark zone, um, but we don't have like large scale estimations of melt yet. Okay. Nice. That sounds interesting. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Roger? Yeah, hello again. Um, a question for, for Laura and Lou again. And again, a, a, apologies for maybe being naive and if I missed it. You, you mentioned that the, there is interest in seeing whether the effects of climate change via rainfall is gonna change the um, microalgae al algae distribution and so on. What about air temperature? It, is that something that um, is accelerating their growth? Do you have enough data to comment on that? Um, um, of course, the air temperature will impact the, the ice mat itself, but since the algal cells are mostly on the ice surface and the temperature of the ice surface is actually fairly constant, okay. so it indirectly, if, yeah, affects them, of course, by uh, accelerating ice melt or like letting snow, a snowpack disappearing earlier. But it, I, I think it, the direct effect is uh, very minimal. Yeah. I, I just wondered if they, they, like all of us, like lying in the warm sun and 
and growing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, I have uh, another question for Catherine. Um, so you said that from the chemical point of view, at some point life could be uh, possible in, or the, the circumstances for life are similar to the ones we find on Earth right now. But I guess there is more than just the chemistry, right? Uh, sorry, what did you say? There is a small what? You, you said that, like you showed in your talk, that the, the chemistry at some point will be quite similar to the chemistry uh, that we find on Earth, or in some places on Earth. But I guess there are more components um, to make life possible, right? Yeah, yeah. for now, on Enceladus has been detected some amino acids, but of course they need a more component like carbon. If we want to look for life as on, on Earth, that is the more <clears throat> relevant component is the carbon. But of course, in the extreme environments, there are some species that grow off in this kind of uh, icy world. But for uh, sure on Enceladus, the traces of organic uh, molecules are not enough sufficient for saying, okay, in fact, we are going to find life as we can find on extreme environment. But the current condition of Enceladus a good target for a start looking life of, of the of Enceladus. That's why in the future there is going to be sent on another spacecraft just for studying Titan and Enceladus for looking thing of life because the information that we have till now is good enough but for going deeper it's necessary another analysis but uh, of course it's, it's not um, like okay we are going to find life on Enceladus like we find on a skin environment because uh, there is not enough uh, data and of course it's necessary more components to forming the building of life. Mm -hmm. How long does one of the missions take? Uh, to arrive to Saturn more or less eight years and doing the flybys three years as they do on Cassini, uh, Galileo on Jupiter, the um, Voyager, uh, for example, the Jewish mission that will be launched next year will arrive in Jupiter uh, on Jupiter in eight years, more or less, eight, nine years. And the flyby, the data that we obtain on Ganymede, that is the moon that I am studying now, uh, will arrive in 10, 11 years. So <laughs> we have to wait till from the next year to 10 years for having the new data. And it's the same for Saturn. Um, and the other planet, do it to a big distance. <laughs> well, the closest is Mars, that took so more or less uh, seven, eight months to arrive there uh, and have the data to see. But for the icy moons, because are the outer planets, uh, the distance are larger. Mm. Oh, that, that's ages, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, yes, perfect. You. Any more questions? I'll check Facebook once more. No, I can't see anything. Okay. If we don't have any more questions, I want to thank um, our four speakers for of today. That was really amazing and really diverse topics. Um, and yeah, thanks for everyone uh, for joining and see you all next week for Richard Ali's talk. Can you put up the uh, PR slide for, uh, uh, for Richard? Hugo, can you put up the advertising slide again, your last slide? I briefly saw him there. There you go. Are you still deciding if you want to join, Magnus, or what is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll be there. I wonder if we'll have music again, or uh, it's Probably. possible. Probably. Nice. So, Rebecca, do you like all the colours available for my uh, future casts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks really good. I think you should drawing things on. Uh, you should start drawing things on the cast. Oh, well, I mean, not, I'm not very good at drawing. Mm. Once I had a cast as a kid and all my friends signed, maybe, maybe there should be a conference and everyone can sign. Well, 
that would be possible. <laughs> when I had the black one, my uh, younger son's partner, uh, she wanted to draw a cross, a skull and crossbones on there. That okay. Didn't happen. 